Welcome to the Adatat Show. Today we're excited to feature Gregory Kennedy, the visionary CMO and founder of BrandZen. With two decades at the forefront of content marketing, he's been instrumental in evolving Silicon Valley startups into worldwide successes. Stay tuned as we delve into Gregory's journey. And know more than you did yesterday. To win when it matters most. Facing multi-billion dollar bet the company litigation. No problem. That's why we're here. Troutman Ami. LLP is a true legal powerhouse. Hi, I'm your host, Pace Soft and this is the Adonit Show. Today we have Gregory Kennedy, the most like of all the Kennedys, I think. How is life treating you, Gregory? And I mean the real deal, not the glossy LinkedIn update. I'm doing great. Things are great. Uh, a lot of rain here in California this winter, uh, but that's good. You know, we've had droughts for, for many years, so, uh, so the rain is uh, always welcome. Hey, there's a snowstorm coming. Not in the Bay Area, but uh, oh. perhaps up in the mountains for sure. What expected curveball has life thrown at you lately? Got any juicy stories that you're just itching this this spill? Oh, wow. Uh, sure. Uh, I have really big news. I will be moving uh, to Seattle. Oh, congratulations. What made yeah. you, What's the impetus for that? Yeah. So uh, it, this will be the first time I've shared this publicly. So uh, yeah, family I have there. And then, uh, you know, my wife is switching jobs. And so we're going to going to relocate. I've been in the Bay Area for about 20 years. So it's a big right. move for me, but I'm excited to, you know, make a change. Yeah, and I, know, I think I know a lot of people that have done that from the Bay Area to uh, Washington. Yeah. It, you know, uh, we were just spent or, five Portland, days there. Usually. We what, spent what, five what, days yeah, there. Yeah. Portland. Right. We spent five days there and a uh, lot of rain, but it felt um, very much like uh, San Francisco in the Bay when I first uh, moved right. here. You know, it really grew up over the last 20 years. They built a lot of skyscrapers in downtown San Francisco that weren't there when I, when I first moved here. So that part was really nice. Like it just reminded me of like uh, the San Francisco I I, uh, I knew and, uh, and and kind of came up in. So I'm excited. Uh, I'm excited about that. So yeah, that's a big it's, big life change. It's less me. it's less crowded I hear. It's definitely a smaller like urban area because you've got like the bear is just sprawled into something uh, that I think is comparable to Los Angeles, right? Like I live now out in the East Bay and the suburbs past Oakland. But you've got like communities all the way down to San Jose. San Jose is over a million people. It just all kind of runs near together Walnut, now. Walnut Creek? Walnut Creek? Yeah, area? yeah, yeah. Very nice. So uh, Seattle awesome. area is not quite as uh, as built up as, as Bay Area. And moving on, the, we're going to talk a little bit about the AI juggernaut in marketing with AI transforming schlubs into supermarketers overnight. How is Brand <laughs> staying ahead without turning it into Skynet for marketing? Yeah, great question. There's a lot of technology out there and there's a lot of, uh, I think, controversy ultimately over like how it's going to be uh, going to be used. And, and I don't think everybody can predict the future. I mean, what I'm seeing is that there's definitely an advantage that people get from being adept uh, with these tools. And so I think that what you're going to see this year is that there's going to be groups of people, let's say in the marketing world, who get really good with using these things and are able to implement them and get a lot of efficiency and get big advantages over other people who refuse to use them. Right. I think, you know, I, I don't hear as much people at this stage uh, who are resisting, but when, you know, chat GPT three and a half first came out, there was a lot of people who were like unhappy and frustrated and they just were really threatened by it. And I don't hear quite as many of those voices uh, anymore, which I think is good. I think people should embrace it and figure out how to use it and be efficient with it. I think people have also found some of the limitations, like it's not perfect. It's not a replacement for, I think what most people do, uh, in marketing, but definitely makes people who, who are dedicated, smart, willing to learn how to use the technology a lot more efficient than they, they were in the past. Yeah. But can AI really truly understand the nuances of human emotion that's needed for brand storytelling? Great question. I don't think so. <laughs> I think that, like, I still would say, let's say, like, large language models mm -hmm. are parlor tricks. I think they're very clever. I think they're very good at, like, uh, like appearing to perhaps embody human intelligence, but I don't think they do. And I think there's a lot of dimensions that they lack. But in a, like, rather superficial context, they do quite well. Uh, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the classic parlor trick, right? It's a cocktail party. Like, it can represent and 
seem lifelike in that context, but I think outside of that, it starts to fall apart pretty quickly if you spend a lot of time with it. So no, I don't think oh, yeah. it's a replacement. I, I found that uh, very early on. It was <laughs> like, uh, it's only as good as data it's trained on, right? So there's certain writers, you can ask it to mimic their style. It's very good because there's a lot of material. But as you get to the more fringe or obscure references, it doesn't have that level of knowledge, right? So there's a lot of limitations to it. And it's it's not creative on its own. Like it still takes a person to come up with uh, ideas. And I just had this conversation with someone the other day. I was like, look, if you're selling writing, you are going to be replaced. But if you're selling ideas, AI is fantastic. It's only going to make you more efficient. So it needs to kind of think through like, what is it that you offer? And like, what is your value proposition? And like going back to my early days in advertising, like we always sold ideas. We sold concepts. We we were not selling ads. We were not selling copywriting, right? And so right. that's been with me for a long time. And I think you have that attitude. Yeah, like it's just another tool. What's your take on AI ethics and marketing? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot happening with Gemini recently. So this is a quite an interesting conversation. I think it depends on the direction that you want to that you want to uh, that you want to take it or definition of it. I, I don't think uh, we know all of the ins and outs or angles exactly with with ethics, you know, in AI. What did I read the other day that they did a simulation with a bunch of different AIs? They took all the major ones: Gemini, Claude, G GPT. They did right. uh, war scenario planning, and they all decided to launch nuclear missiles. So, At like, each other, <laughs> yeah, At us or each other, right? If, if it's uh, at us, I mean, the, I'm not in this. I believe the simulation pitted them against themselves as like AI was powering a nation state and doing the decision making. Yeah, and they all like one of the quotes from the AI was like, "We have them, let's use them." So I think there's a lot of questions in like how we define and like think through the ethics of AI. Clearly, how much is Branson using AI, and how are you doing without creeping people out? Yeah, that's a really good question. I tell everybody, use every tool. You know, I'm unapologetically pretty nerdy. I love to like play around with this you, you stuff. Have, you, you have a, uh, I was going to say Twitter, you have an X bot, right? That, that responds kind of generically, right? Yeah, I, have, I like I like to play around with all of this kind of stuff. And uh, and it's it's fun. Uh, and I think it's, it's great. Like I love tools. I've always been on the leading edge of this stuff. I think the technology is always something to embrace. Um, and so, yeah. And so when it comes to the specifics, I don't really share like how I do it. Most people I, I speak with, let's say customers are like, do you use AI? And I'm always like, of course. And I'm like, cool. <laughs> the conversation doesn't go any further uh, than that. And I was recently joking with people like, like if I read anything that starts with like in, in the, the realm, realm of like, <laughs> I mean, like maybe you should edit that. Right. I've been using Grammarly for oh, yeah. years and I think they've had a, "Quote unquote AI" for as long as I remember, and that's all. Especially their prompt it's, that's been really useful for me. I, I'm sitting there, I'm writing. I just I can't think of what else to write, and it can help me just like finish the sentence or you know help it flow. And that's it's perfect. Yeah, I've been um, a paid subscriber to that for many years. Like I think I think that tool is uh, is excellent. I personally don't use a lot of the ideation stuff, but the mechanical stuff I think is great. Yeah, I have a problem with changing tone and or changing. Uh, like I'll go from first to third person. It reminds me that I'm doing that. Especially when I go back to an article, I'll be like, I need to fix this. And then I'm like, I'll change the third person. It just tells you, oh, no, you you mean to be first person or third person. It'll go back and change everything for you. And, and it's not writing for me. It's probably the same thing that if I had an editorial assistant, I'd say, hey, look at this and clean it up. So yeah. it's not writing for me. I don't think it could ever really match my voice. There's a lot of things like as a native speaker of English that you just do intuitively that I actually can't even describe very well. Uh, but people who are not, these tools I think are fantastic and are really, really helpful in that type of use case. Like English in particular has a lot of just obscurity that other languages perhaps don't. Like I said, I, like when I'm confronted with this stuff, I always forget just how much you understand intuitively when you speak and write uh, in English and you're a native speaker. Is there any nightmare scenarios where AI may have gone so far, too far so far? Where AI has gone too far? Uh, that's interesting. And that was a mouthful, sorry. I, I think I think the Gemini stuff is curious, but I don't think it's AI going too far. I think they put guardrails on it that, you know, like I would define it as like made a lot of historical inaccuracies or just was factually incorrect. And for me, like, that would be my frustration with um, any of these tools is like uh, knowledge and information and facts and, 
you know, in an interesting, perhaps post fact world. But I think that that's for me, the, the challenges and, you know, uh, we're all struggling with exactly how to define it. But I think that that's where the issues are. I think it, it flows into the ethics question, too, that you were talking about who defines those facts, who, you know, and how do you, how do you so manage how do you that? Balance it, balance AI with human intuition. Yeah, I mean, I think what's happening on X with community notes is a really good example of how to handle it. Uh, you know, right. that, that they've, I mean, I, I don't know if I, I guess it would encapsulate at least the way I see it is that Elon has swung the pendulum from like just what used to be a methodology where they just banned anybody who they felt violated their, their terms of service. I think they're very opaque about what those rules were, you know, less like banning, but there's mm-hmm. still enforcement and the enforcement is like, labeling content based on like uh some type of crowdsourced or or community version of that which i really like i think it's a great solution and i think it creates for some very entertaining uh content right like i like that the content is out there and it has a label the one where the guy claims to be buying that mansion in miami and then the community note said that hey this thing is actually for rent and here's the link on zillow was just an (laughs) excellent excellent way to handle it like i can't think of a better well, way a, like there, there was a guy in front of the lambo yeah and that's they saw, the, they, saw, they saw they saw the rental sticker also i think it's out, great but, it's yeah. like it's I mean, like here's the content here's what he said and like hey here's some like let's not even call them facts it's just called it information make up your own mind right well uh, real time calling out bs you know yeah i love it it's, it's like somebody's mom that's that's bs <laughs> mothers always have that intuition right they know when you're lying to them. Yeah, I think it's a great way to handle it. I'm very happy with it. I think that's a much better approach than like just arbitrarily banning people and taking what I would call a very authoritarian uh, right. way and then, you know, being the arbiters of it all. Like I, I, I much more prefer this, I, I, you know, and, and like I still think there's things that deserve to be banned, of course. You know, I'm not, uh, I'm not an extremist. Well, I think the community notes is awesome. It's, it's also highly it's entertaining. I think at least right. once a day, I, I laugh. Too, right? Yeah, it's great it's for uh, engagement. So I'm all for it. I think it's an excellent way to handle it. Especially politicians who will say one thing and write under it, and we'll just call them out. Be like, you're not even in the realm. It's not five percent. It's fifty. How do you see AI evolving in the next five years in the industry? Yeah, five years is hard to say. I, I, you know, there's a lot of new information that's coming out about areas where you know it, it is taking away jobs, and I think they're kind of obvious, but you know, you had the Duolingo, let's call it announcements where that they were going to like not need as many uh, human translators to do translation. Right. And then you've you had Klarna announce that they're able to do a lot of the customer service with AI. They claim it, it 700 people. It was a big number. But I, I think that those things in, it, it are obvious, like, you know, customer service is a good example where all of the uh, information or answers to questions are documented, like customer service reps in general are not like answering these questions on the fly. And so the idea right. that AI is going to solve for that makes a lot of sense. I think translation is the same thing there. It's a mechanical, very definable challenge that I think AI would do really well. So I think like things will transition and evolve, but automation has been around in Silicon Valley for a long time. You know, right. a, a lot, lot of companies- this is not AI, anyways. A lot it's just automation. I think someone else pointed totally. out a lot. It's just, it's just if then. Yeah, absolutely. So- and like we've had automation since the beginning of the industrial revolution, right? I mean, people don't right. go in uh, plow fields by hand anymore. So automation is is just the natural progression of technology. And there's always these waves that come, and it can be painful in terms of like uh, the transition of certain sectors of the economy and certain jobs. And so I don't want to like gloss over that, which I think a lot of economists do. They talk about it in very obscure and vague terms. Like it's painful for people if you're making a living as as translator. I don't want to uh, in any way gloss that over. But the reality is like the market does change and things do automate. And I've always thought about my career really clearly about this because when I was younger, growing up, my father worked in uh, in printing and in like with typographic designer. And there was an that's an industry that saw like some really dramatic automation happened very quickly, right? With the switch from like traditional to desktop publishing. So it's always been something I've been acutely aware of. And I would encourage everyone to think really deeply about like what the implications are for your choices in your career. What type of skills should marketers focus on if they want to get on the AI revolution? Yeah. Well, going back to what I said first, you got to be good at having ideas. 
I think right. ideas will always be valuable. I think no matter what type of like tools we have or the mechanics, <laughs> ideas are the most valuable commodity. In fact, like if the technology evolves to where you can kind of just have the machines do what you need it to do, it's the ideas that are going to have the most value. And I feel like I saw this in advertising very early on when um it started to become more automated and right. uh, more digital. That ideation and your ability to create like new ideas quickly was really valuable. And it wasn't necessarily the way it worked before because you can throw up things and test them. And there's just a lot of things that were unlocked that I think are pretty obvious and everyone is aware of today. And so that's what I tell people to focus on is like ideas, strategic ideas, business strategy, like how do you add value and how do you uh, utilize all the tools uh, so that your value is not in like the implementation you value is in like driving the creation. Speaking of all the tools, the MarTech landscape is currently looking like a tale of two cities. How is Brandzen navigating the consolidation and fragmentation without getting lost? Yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's there's a lot of stuff out there. It's complicated. I think that like you've got um, this transition happening with the way the technology is going, particularly with like cookies going away. We've known right. about this for uh, for a long time, right? And so there's a lot of tools and a lot of approaches that aren't going to work the same way that they that they did, right? So you've got a whole sector of of martech tools that are going to be challenged. But I think it opens the door for uh, new technology, and that's why I thought it's like this tale of two cities where there's certain segments that are going to struggle, and then there's certain segments that are gonna are gonna flourish. And so I think that that's what we will. Uh, what we'll, what we'll see. I don't know if it's exactly happened yet. I still think you've got cookies working in certain browser, I don't know, cohorts. Right. But by the end of the year, I think it's going to be a different uh, different story. So I worked in the mobile app space and had a startup in that. And like that whole transition already happened, right? So like you used to be able to have perfect attribution when it came to uh, marketing and app. And that all went away when Apple decided to block or eliminate most of the signals that people were, right. uh, were using. And so a whole bunch of new approaches emerged. You know, there's much more of a focus on creative testing, that type of thing. So it just kind of shifted it all in a different, a different direction. I think the same thing will happen with uh, desktop and uh, just all digital marketing. How do you decide between the big suite solutions and niche tools? Well, that's a good question. Uh, I think it depends on a lot of things. I think it depends on your own tech stack. You know, so what's right. compatible with what you're doing? Like if I was to give people recommendations on how to pick tools, like mm -hmm. obviously like, you know, what is the tool stack that you work in and like what's compatible uh, with that? I think that's probably the most important, uh, most important question, right? Like at a high level, like, you know, older or larger enterprises, they can, they tend to be like Microsoft based, right? So you've got to find things that, that work with that. And I think fighting against that is not a good idea. I think for like smaller individuals, I'm a big fan of point solutions. I think point solutions work uh, really well. And so sometimes you can be challenged in terms of like aggregating them all together can create issues. But I think there's a point where you kind of transition from like using lots of point solutions to trying to like consolidate into a few different uh, stacks or tools that work really well together. So I think given like your size or scale, your needs, there's an obvious continuum of like, Point solution is to like larger platforms. I think if I was just kind of quickly uh, summarize it. Is there any MarTech investment that you made that just didn't pan out or was a disaster? And that's an interesting question. I mean, you know, I worked for a lot of people who were selling MarTech. So I would say all right. of our solutions were pretty good. <laughs> and I was very happy. I was very happy with like, for like what we, uh, what we did, you know, that, that didn't pan out. I think a good example would be dynamic creative. It's something I was always very excited about. I came from the creative world. Right. I always thought dynamic creative was an, it's an obvious thing that everybody always wanted, right? Like, why can't we update these ads with different images automatically or different copy automatically, right? And automate right. all of that. It's like this kind of holy grail that I've never really seen it work well. There's been lots works, of people It works in search, though. That's interesting. Thing. In search, it's... Yeah. You know, if Correct. you type in a state, you'll get all, you'll get, you know, travel to hotels.com will have travel to Georgia. If you typed in travel to Georgia. Yeah. And there's certain use cases where it works even in display, right? With like right. e-commerce because they boil down the elements to something uh, very generic, right? It just shows like a product and you have a copy line. So there are people who've done it. 
but there's always this belief that you could go a lot further in the creative and have like a bunch of their unique elements that would be recombined and maybe it'll it'll emerge right like i feel still there's a future where you know perhaps ai is really good at creating content on the fly with dali and all of these things so that 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 future might still happen where it can like create creative that's you know targeted for each impression right it's it's not impossible but i don't think we're 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 anywhere close to that there's a few like you just described like use cases where it works really well but overall i think dynamic creative was the one that never really played out and it was definitely an investment that we made at different companies that i worked at that mm-hmm. never really really got where we wanted it to go any other trends that you predict uh for 20 general general in, in, in the martech maybe in the next 10 years uh so i think that the uh the um contextual uh advertising uh approach is what's going to ultimately win i think there's a lot of people who still want to hang on to the targeted world that uh, we know from the last 10 years right so right. uh yeah like and that was even like the app space that i was in that, and that was what i saw like at uh sojourn or ad roll like using data to do targeted advertising. And there's still big companies who are going to be able to do it. They have a lot of information, a lot of data, and they're going to they're gonna make the investments to do it. But I think that ultimately it'll prove that it's too expensive, like over the very right. long term, like you said, 10 years. And that uh, contextual-based technology will get so good that the, the combination of the legal risk and the technological costs for doing like what we all would call targeted advertising won't make sense anymore. And I think that future will, will happen at some point. So if you believe that uh, AI or this dynamic creative concept that I'm talking about, that that within a given, this is going to get really nerdy. So in, within a given uh, page impression or ad impression, however that per impression is defined, it might not be on the page anymore. You have a lot of information that is untargeted, but you know a lot about that particular impression. So you could use right. all that information to create targeted uh, advertising, targeted creative that would convert better than if it was just generic, right? So when I first started in digital advertising, that was exactly how we did it. <laughs> we had technology that measured on a placement by placement basis, and we didn't have targeting, but we were right. able to understand like in this given slot, this very specific slot, like what converted better. And we just continued to iterate on that. And I think that that's exactly where it'll go, that there'll be a technology that looks at this slot and maybe it can create imagery on the fly. Maybe it can like write copy on the fly. It can do all kinds of things to optimize it. And it'll get better and better and better at doing that. And that will ultimately prove to be a better system because you won't have the targeting costs and the legal challenges associated with it. What's the most uh, overrated tool you've seen in the industry? Overrated tool. Oh, that's a really yeah. good uh, a good question. Slack. Like, I yeah, think that, I, like... I'm not sure I 100% get Slack. I've had AIM to, you know, Instant Messenger, IRC, um, IC, right. ICQ, you name it, right? And yeah. well, IRC before that, yeah, obviously. But it just feels like another iteration to me. It's like, oh, it's another chat platform. So it I just remember has like some integrations. It, it has some integrations in it. That's about it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It launched and they're like, it's the email replacement. That was the initial press release. They got all this attention. I was like, this is cool. I'm like, excited. The email and I got it. And I'm like, this is just aim. Right? I was like, this is not I remember being actually very, very specifically like, and I think they they have don't use that product positioning anymore because it is not an email no, replacement. And I, honestly, the first year it was out, I got invited to Slack every day. And now I don't at all. Like, I don't, I mean, I know people that work on Slack. It's just not the same. It doesn't have the same buzz anymore. I think people just yeah, never. No, you couldn't contact people, not within your organization. That was when I was like, it's a cool tool and I use it, but it wasn't an email replacement. It wasn't allowing me to, it's not an open protocol that like everybody could, uh, could use and build on and you could communicate with. And like, I like the vision, but there's not anywhere, they're not really any closer to achieving that. It's not, it's not an open protocol that you they were can like, integrate. Um, I think Gmail across. or someone, I mean, Google has to buy them and integrate them with like Gmail or something like that. And then that would be, yeah, it would be. And you could debate email. like the private network versus the public network. I mean, email is an open protocol and anybody can write any client, do anything with it. And I think like that's pretty unique. Yeah, but it's still, it's still traveling on an open protocol. I mean, it's still TCP IP. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, they, they, yeah, and they, I mean, yeah, I actually don't, I mean, even, I, I, even though it's encrypted, you know. Yeah, I actually don't know if it goes to their servers or something. No, I I think it does. It's a direct direct. 
I don't know either. I haven't looked at it yeah. yet. So how do you manage all this data across different platforms? We've talked about that before. I think it's it's uh it's it's complicated. I think right. like it depends on where you're coming from or what you mean by that question. So I guess like I would say as me as a marketer and I'm looking mm-hmm. at, you know, all the different marketing that we do. And I think people get really hung up on trying to measure everything in terms of that they they want to have this like cross platform attribution or cross platform measurement thing and they really worry about edge cases or channels that don't really move the needle. And so I think people waste a lot of cycles trying to like incorporate or develop measurement that works across everything when they don't need to. They only need to generally focus on the ones where the volume of spend is or the volume of interactions are or however your marketing is set up. It's right. not required to measure everything and put all together. And I think people put a lot of effort uh, and they don't need to. They just need to look at the ones that are important and then do the best they can. So for some people, if you do have a big budget and you're advertising on both Google and, and Facebook, that's a big challenge. And so depending on your scope and scale, you have to make a decision like, do you optimize for one or the other? This is a really complex question and it really depends on, on what you're trying to do. At a smaller scale, usually people can only do really good on like one or two channels. And so I would just say like, get really good at one of them and focus on like Facebook, Instagram, right? And then you can use all their tools, their ecosystem, uh, uh, and just optimize for that. So what's your take on the IAB sandbox discussion? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not that up on it. I do think that like, ultimately, what I understand about it is like, I don't know if there's an alternative, right? Like, it, they're gonna have to come up with something. And I think there's just a lot of like, people are frustrated that the current system is going away. And so, you know, they'll Do you be... ever find yourself screaming at, screaming at, at, at the... At your computer? That's really, that's quite funny. Uh, not about this. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> okay, so what about what? About what then? Oh, that's quite funny. I think it depends on, uh, on uh, I think within the ad tech world, like, you know, I, we've known this is happening for a long time. And so I've just been very... Well, yeah, um, I scream about that all the time. I just wrote about today yeah. about, you know, how companies aren't prepared and how some companies are panicking internally. And, you know, it's, it's getting out there that they just aren't prepared. They keep on thinking it's going to be pushed back, pushed back, pushed back. And now, you know, they're talking about, oh, maybe the EU will come in and maybe it'll be pushed back another year or two. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I, was, I always took the approach of that, like, it's inevitable, all the signals will go away. And so that's why I'm very bullish on like contextual approaches, creative optimization, like finding solutions right. that, that don't, that don't, I, in my, my world, in my mind, I've already moved beyond this. Like I'm, I'm thinking about the future of where it's primarily untargeted given the way people uh, were targeting uh, in the past. So we've got just a little bit. So if you were on a deserted island, what drink would you smuggle in? What drink would I smuggle in? Yeah. And, and water doesn't count. Give us the goods. Of coffee, of course. And uh, I'm actually a big fan of canned coffee. And my favorite brand is called Mr. Brown's from Taiwan. Yeah, I think everyone says they need either liquid courage or caffeine. So when you wake up in the morning, how do you fuel your genius? What is your ultimate feast? Uh, well, I, I mean, I, I already mentioned coffee. That's like uh, my favorite uh, my favorite thing to... Uh, you, you, just, you just get to world domination first. You're very efficient. Uh, yeah, coffee is the, is the, is the key. Do you mean like in terms of, uh, cuisine? I guess so. Yeah. (laughs) Is there a meal that's your kryptonite? Oh, kryptonite? Yeah. I'm not big on, uh, fast food. No. No. I, uh, I grew up vegan and so I never really ate hamburgers and I don't like them. You grew up vegan. I don't hear that a lot. Yeah. I've been, I was vegetarian vegan like most of my life. Right. Uh, And so I just don't really like meat a whole lot. Oh, you don't, never just, you don't like have a steak the first time and you're like, oh my goodness, this is amazing. It just didn't. No, now I'm, I'm flexitarian. Like I'll eat whatever people serve and I, I'm not really worried about you're, it. You're, I don't a, like... you're, you're, you're a what? I'm sorry. I call it flexitarian. Like I just kind of like, okay. I prefer vegetarian. And like okay. when I eat my own food or cook, I generally am vegetarian. But if I go out with people and people want to eat stuff, like I, I'm not really too worried about it. Like. Some of the rule, only rules I have is like I'm not really big on fast food. Like I don't really like it, but you know if that's what people want to eat, like I can kind of like roll with it. I'm not really too worried about it. So a cheeseburger is your kryptonite. Yeah, sure, I'll go with that. Yeah, every genius has a muse. What are you listening to on your earphones these days? Oh, uh, lots of nerdy podcasts. Uh, right. My favorite podcast is the Compound. So it's like these two uh, stockbrokers from New York. 
and they right. remind me um, of my family in New York City. They're very Long Island, and I just listen to it because I feel like I'm, I'm and then, like then you listening. Have to say Long Island. And... Yeah, it's like it's like my cousins or my brothers or something. Like I listen to that, and like, I, and I like to follow the stock market. I think it's fun, but I listen to that right. one in particular because like I just feel like I, I miss that uh, that part of like New York, and I like to really connect to that sometimes. And so I, I love to listen to. That. So the Gregory Kennedy origin story. Every soup, every superhero has an origin story. What is yours? And it involves radioactive spiders. I want to hear about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm from I'm from New York City. I grew up in uh in Manhattan, uh, right. and I went to an art high school. And so I like to joke that uh, I didn't really have much of a choice. Like I was kind of pushed into this creative career at a young age, and I was right. successful at it, but I didn't really like it. It wasn't like a good fit for my personality. So right. eventually, I I went into the marketing side and was like, okay, why don't I take you know, what I've done on the creative side and kind of transition. It's a marquee side. And a lot of people recommended it. They're like, look, you know why you're successful is not because of like the design you make or the art you draw or something like that. It's because of your business strategy, your ability to like work with customers and like lead teams and understand uh, the psychology of, of buyers. And so that was very successful. And I was really happy when I made that, made that move. And I still get to like participate in the creative side, which I, which I love. Uh, but it's just a much better fit in terms of like, uh, personality. Before we move on, or and actually ask everyone if you could send yourself a text message, a time traveling text message into the past when you started in this industry, what would you tell yourself? Oh my God, buy Bitcoin at two cents. At <laughs> two cents. <laughs> everyone, I need to <laughs> come on. I, I have to remember, be like, it can't be stock or money advice. Because <laughs> everyone does that. Apple, Google. Ne- and never sell. Never sell Bitcoin. Ever. <laughs> buy it at two cents and just hold and hold. You'll be fine. And that's a wrap. Huge shout out to Gregory Kennedy for joining us today. Truly the Kennedy most likely to get stuck in a rainstorm, but still show up smiling. Gregory, your stories about moving cities and tackling the AI beast in marketing have been nothing short of enlightening and entertaining. Big thanks to Trout Miniman LLP as well. The folks who make sure we don't have to record this in the dark. Your support means we get to keep having these brilliant, if not slightly off-kilter conversations. Listeners, you've been fantastic. Until next time, stay curious, stay bold, and know more than you did yesterday.